All right, hello everyone. Today we have a wonderful guest who is near and dear to us, like literally in the next building over. We have Dr. Jasmine McNeely, and she hails from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She's currently an associate professor in media production management and technology at the University of Florida. Her bachelor's is from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in journalism and Afro-American studies. Her master's is in mass communication from the University of Florida. She also has a master's of education in measurement, evaluation, statistics, and assessment from the University of Illinois, Chicago. She has also, if that's not enough, she has a PhD <laughs> in mass communications from the University of Florida and she has a whole juris doctorate. She a whole lawyer attorney out here from, she has her juris doctorate degree from the University of Florida. So currently she describes herself as an attorney, critical public interest technologist, I like that phrase, and social scientist who studies emerging media and technology with a view toward influencing law and policy. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yes. Yes, I'm glad excited. to get you here. <laughs> it took us a while. Yes. We got here. A big while. I feel like we've been saying that a lot, but like for real, this one took us a while too. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I think that was five advanced degrees on the whole. I'm just saying it. You're Is just collecting them like the right? Thanos stones. <laughs> Two, it's yeah, enough, okay, yeah. Maybe four. It's enough, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if when you were younger, you thought you would be doing what you're doing today. Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. Um, I thought if you had asked me like some of the earliest things I thought I was going to be, I think I was going to be an architect and an mm -hmm. artist. Um, because my, my parents used to put us in like these like after school and or pre-college programs in Milwaukee, so the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee had a lot of programs, and Marquette had a lot of like pre college programs aimed at whether first gen or black students, young people coming up. And they would put us in these pre college programs, particularly in the, in the summer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would go, we would go, my brother and I, we would go to these different, different programs. And one of the ones I loved, um, was an architecture program and they mm -hmm. taught us some of the beginnings of like CAD like way back yeah. old <laughs> computer software and you know MS-DOS like little programming kind of things and that was so fun I mean, like an architect or an artist and then I was all, I also went to a, a urban journalism program and I was like oh mm -hmm. journalism is, is really good obviously that one kind of stuck I guess a little bit but <laughs> uh the the other stuff too, still interested in like the technological part. And I still love architecture, although I obviously didn't pursue it as a, a profession. Maybe yet. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But, yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, is Milwaukee pretty diverse? I feel like it has like strong diversity. So if you're talking population wise, there is a significant uh, number of black or African-American people, Latino people, Latinx, um, mm -hmm. Southeast Asian as well. Mm. Um, and Native American, this is Wisconsin. We have, yeah. we have tribes. Um, do they always mix together? No. Mm. <laughs> so that's one of the things uh, Milwaukee has been known for over its post-civil rights history, pre-civil rights history too, quite frankly, but post-civil rights history is being I don't know, between it and Detroit switching top spots for most segregated, which is wow. unfortunate. But um, it does have diversity. You just have to I go to the places. Question. Yeah. I asked that question because I, I, I just recently learned a lot more about like the civil rights history of that area and how, you know, there are a lot of black people in Milwaukee. And so I, in my mind, I feel like you could have different role models who had different career pathways as a kid growing up in that area. Yeah. I mean, so Milwaukee, 
Milwaukee's Midwest. Milwaukee's a Rust Belt town. So yeah. you have all these people who migrated up with like these mm-hmm. good factory jobs and then the factory jobs went away and you're left with like people looking for other things to do. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of people and um, my parents, uh, they went back to school. So, you know, college, uh, what they didn't have the traditional uh, college, we think path, but mm-hmm. that was something that was stressed to us as kids like you it's not a it's not a question uh if you will but you must uh do that (laughs) and to to um break out of certain cycles and stereotypes um that were you know placed on us as black people living in middle class blue collar uh area codes uh one of the other things that uh, Milwaukee is known for is certain area codes have certain, I don't know, our, our colleagues in uh, public health would say social determinants. Mm. And um, we used to live in some of those uh, zip codes. And that's fine. Because like when you were a kid, you're like, whatever. <laughs> but um, that's you're before. You're not really aware. Yeah. You're not, you're not aware because, you know, that's just, you have your friends, you go to school, you get bussed out or whatever. Yeah. And also, um, that's before you know about predictions made about you or <laughs> inferences made about you related to. Or you have social media where people are highlighting, you know, affluence and wealth and all the other things. Yeah. Or you can make some comparisons that way. Right. So having been born in 1980, I was pre, <laughs> very much pre-social media determining uh, or influencing me a whole mm-hmm. lot. But yeah, so. Yeah, but I think it's amazing that you, you know, figured out kind of almost the direction you were heading because of some of these pre-collegiate programs. I mean, kind of. I would have never thought like this would I be doing. Like, <laughs> like uh, uh, a college professor right now? No. <laughs> Did same, same. It wasn't, yeah. So. Did you go to like a special high school? Did they focus on any of the topics that you study now? No, but you know what? I We were like bust out to, like I said, um, a suburban uh, high school. And it did have one of the, the things that I did participate in for like uh, my last two and a half years there was newspaper and photojournalism. Mm. So it was a newspaper. And I, you know, did hang around in the photography uh, zone. Now, this, of course, was before, like, computers were the major thing for uh, technology. I mean, we had a keyboard in class, right? Learned to type better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it wasn't the Mavis about... Beacon. Right. It was Mavis Beacon. Yeah, <laughs> Mavis. But it wasn't about, like... How to set up your LinkedIn profile to get noticed by recruiters mm-hmm. or anything like that? So, yeah. yeah, we I never learned to type because literally the computer science class was at the same time as the keyboarding class. So I was like, if I just do computer science, I will by osmosis learn how to type. <laughs> by osmosis, oh my lord! I think I made the good okay. choice. Yes. <laughs> So then you decided to go to University of Wisconsin Madison. Like, was that number one on your list, or <laughs> no? It wasn't, but it was. It was. <laughs> so the high school. It's funny because the high school I went to, like you know, you have the uh, what are they called? Guidance counselors, mm-hmm. and they'd be like, "Okay, um, we want to start collecting your your applications. Um, so I'll I'll take your UW application first. And I was like, how do you know I'm even applying? Yeah, but it was just like a thing for them. It was a, it definitely, I don't know if it is now anymore. I don't really pay attention to it. Maybe I should, I, whatever. But it was definitely a feeder school for, mm-hmm. like, the expectation was you at least apply to UW. And you go anywhere you want to. But mm-hmm. Wisconsin is right there. It's two hours away. You have in-state tuition. <laughs> and you you, you know. You could apply there. 
So. Yeah, that, that's that been a theme, like people being like, you know what, that in-state tuition coupled with maybe an in-state scholarship has definitely been a lot of motivation. Listen, in-state tuition is is great, Public, especially public school, in-state tuition. Uh, Wisconsin, I don't know if they still do this. Um, they think they may have stopped the program, but Wisconsin and Minnesota had this reciprocity program where mm -hmm. Wisconsin students, if you went to Minnesota, uh, you only had to pay like a little more versus the huge out of state tuition. And so they that's how they recruited students from Wisconsin to go to Minnesota. Now the thing is, uh, students from Wisconsin were going to Minnesota, but not a whole lot of Minnesota students could get into Wisconsin. Mm. And so they <laughs> I think they stopped the program because they weren't making as much money as they wanted to. Um, the program. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Not so, ideal. Did you know that, you know, because when you going through your undergrad program, you know, we're always like, yes, I'm going to get my grown person job as soon as I'm done. Like what made you not stop after your bachelor's? So I, I was like going to get my grown person job <laughs> <laughs> after I was done. But I uh, I saw this um, grad program and it was called was one of the grad programs I applied to. It's called Florida Fly-Ins. And they still kind of have it. I don't know if they do it too much anymore, but it's like, if you want to do international like reporting, you do this Florida Fly-Ins where we, you go to like, I think they were going to Costa Rica on a regular basis and you do like mm -hmm. an investigative journalism, photojournalism project. And I was like, oh, that's cool because I had read a book during my <laughs> later years. I read a book um, that was written by this black um, guy who was like one of the international um, editors for the AP. And there's not, not a lot of us working at this <laughs> press and the Washington Post doing international journalism. And I read it and I was like, all oh, his adventures. He was in Rwanda when things popped off. He was like so many different uh, places and so many different stories. And I was like, oh, that's uh, that's great. That's, you know, that's it. So I could do Florida fly-ins. I'm going to fly to the University of Florida, just get a master's degree, and then go on my merry international photojournalism investigator reporter way. That didn't happen, obviously, mm. but <laughs> it was one of the things I thought about. At the same time, while I was uh, an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin, I was doing undergraduate research. Mm. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and apply in a part of both like McNair undergraduate research scholars which like prepares you to like apply for grad programs doing research stuff and I thought okay yeah. well, you know I'll use this because if you're <laughs> McNair your uh, application fees are waived <laughs> yeah. so yeah. I'll use this I'll apply and, uh, you know, to these like master's programs, like a year, 18 months, maybe two years. And I, I'll go about my married business because by then I have a job. That didn't happen. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I mean, there's an expectation for the McNair Scholars Program that you finish your PhD within, <laughs> within 10 years of the program. But Florida has this way of kind of like sucking you in and like I don't know like sinking its teeth into you so you can't you can't leave so I I empathize with what happened to you because it happened to me too I have a question I'm curious about what research looks like in the journalism space because you know most people we have on are like you know core CS folks where we might do experiments we're running simulations or things like that so what does journalism research look like See, so it really just depends on what kind of um what, what kind of thing you're studying and what what kind of outcomes you want to have from that so it could be experiments it could there are a lot of folks who do experimental research experimental research using technology or about technology including social media artificial intelligence all different kinds of things like that and and of course the the traditional media things television film advertising all of that different stuff so there are experiments there are survey there's survey research and then for me i'm a policy person so i could do both the the survey and experiments but i also dig into like what does the policy say 
Like, what does that say? What does it mean? Also, what have the courts decided? How they've translated these words into actions? And um, what is the me- how is the media covering these policies? And how are they uh, being transferred throughout the like policy ecosystems? Um, and then what is it, how does that translate to how we interact with media and technology? those are so it's various ways and then there's like I have colleagues who do history so they're in archives related to media and 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 things like that so it's it's I think it's similar very similar to what uh, like the CS and some of the engineering folks do Uh, usually we don't build a lot of things but there are folks who build like apps and and test them out as well so that's really cool there's a lot of data there right and so understanding data is important in every discipline which i think gets missed by a lot of us it's just journalism data people are like "Mm, words (laughs) you know like like, words and people right which is not traditionally computing necessarily right yeah and perhaps that's you know (laughs) you could say that might be a little bit of a problem um yes especially related to the many different kinds of new media new technology that are deployed so yeah i 100 percent agree i remember well first of all i want to ask your phd was that like a jd phd or did you like get your phd and then say you know what i need this law degree By that time, I was like, I didn't need anything. But anyway, uh, so I did the M- I did a joint degree program. So I started here as an MA student. And like okay. that first semester as a master's student, I saw, oh, wait, the College of Journalism has this joint degree program with the College of Law. And I was like, what is this? Oh, this seems interesting. It was pulling me away from my international, uh, you know, investigative photojournalism track that I had designed for myself but Mm -hmm. I thought oh this is interesting so I applied and got into the program and I'd done by the time I started law school I'd done my first year as an MA student and so I had to do my first year as a law student and after that first year of law school I like mixed the last couple of uh, master's level classes with the rest of the law credits I had to take so it was an MAJD and then I just like stayed the extra two years to finish like the PhD like the dissertation you just brushed over that like it was the easiest thing on the planet. Like, oh, I just did these years of law school. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like how? No, I don't mean to say it like that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> it, 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 you, I, I think, I think if I look back on it, it it was tedious. There was some like stress, obviously stressful. Some of it. But at the same time, I had some fun. Like I, I met some people, had some fun, did, did some things, experienced some mm-hmm. things. Like the negative experiences that I've had, I think I would have had just because they're hu- they're human based or interpersonally based mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. systemic based. Some of them too. That we're, yeah, that we're all being I mean it's seriously. Politics, but really. <laughs> I would have, you know, I could have experienced those without the the education too so i don't blame necessarily i don't say it was a waste of time like or or just something i brush over but i i will say i do enjoy learning stuff right and and reading uh yeah reading (laughs) too right exactly i do enjoy learning including reading um the other stuff I think is kind of human condition, mm-hmm. unfortunate stuff. So, yeah. I didn't know. I feel like there's a special type of person that ends up in law school. Like, <laughs> that, like there's that a couple deal... of different kinds of people we can, we can yeah, talk Yeah. <laughs> that can deal with, I mean, politics is, is really contentious and it is not something I think that we consider often when i mean you're a policy person so you absolutely have to think about this on a regular basis but even within law school there are factions of people and so i think it's it was good preparation for becoming a professor (laughs) (laughs) yeah I, i always said that like law school was like high school with older people but uh 
less cool people. <laughs> so, like, you know, like they were like straight up factions like that. And you could wow. name them and you knew yeah. who like traveled in the different circles. But whatever. That is wild. One thing I wanted to ask you just across like your academic trajectory from before, um, were there any like groups or organizations that you were part of that helped to, you know, get you through? So I, I will, you know, when I look back at it, I would tell people and tell students, I didn't really hang out on campus. <laughs> um, I, I didn't. And, you know, so when students come to me about like, oh, what did you do? I will say I, I was off campus. We'll see. I mean, I was a part of like BALSA, which is Black Law Students Association, but that well, it's like a light lift, right? You go <laughs> sometimes, you you don't. But and I was never a part of like a grad student association or, or anything like that. I just didn't do that. Undergrad, yes. But grad school, no, I was off campus. And I so I tell my advice to students is always find your people off campus like mm. that find the normal people <laughs> so find the normal people who are going to be like oh that's cool but like yeah let's just go get something to eat, Where are we gonna go eat? Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's go to church <laughs> let's go you gonna come play basketball with us or you know whatever you're you, whatever the case may be it's that you're not thinking about um mm -hmm. school because school is not your life it's not it's not. And once you make it your life, that's when like the huge stress, stress and thinking about, oh, this person can do something to my career and all this stuff comes into play because you don't realize that there's like a whole different world offside, offside of these acreage of, of mm -hmm. university campus that goes on without the university. And so get off campus, find these normal people. That's who I, <laughs> that's who I hung out with was like normal people. Just <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you. I did something similar. I had, there was like a whole ditch. You're probably familiar with Detroit ballroom. So yes. I had a whole group of folks who did that and we would go on ski trips and we would just do normal stuff with them. They would call us the school kids, but I'm like, we're all the same age. <laughs> <laughs> But I happened to like meet this group of folks who had all gone to high school together and they had this network and they were just like, hey, come with us. So, But I definitely tell students all the time that they need to have something, like you said, that's outside of school so that school doesn't become your whole life. So that when one thing impacts school, it feels like your whole life is falling apart. A hobby off campus. Yes. A hobby, a faith community, uh, uh, um hiking club whatever the case may be whatever yeah mm. do that what were do some that, of the please. undergrad orgs that you're a part of yeah undergrad like i said i did like undergrad research and like mcnair i was part of black uh, uh student association or student organization whatever it was called bsa bso bsu yeah, black student union it was one of them <laughs> uh, <laughs> um I was on newspaper. I don't know what you want me to do about that. One. I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did newspaper. Um, so a couple of different newspapers uh, on campus. Uh, gospel choir. Okay. Ooh, she be singing. Okay, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Esquire. Yeah. And then some like, <laughs> you know, I did SOAR, which was like students orienting students. I did that. And like, uh, I was, I worked in the dorm. So like we had resident uh, assistants, but we also had multicultural resident consultants, which was like, make sure that the people of color in the dorms felt welcome. We had programming. So really like it was a real effort to make sure students of color felt um, like they could live in the dorms and also educating other students about like, hey, this might be your first time meeting one of us. Right. <laughs> Here's some bonnet. things you might want to know about. You're going to see it. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so did that for two years. So, yeah, those kinds of things. I like, As you started naming things, I realized that I've been to whatever the Black Student Organization Union Association is at Madison because I used to go for trainings and things like that related to mentorship up there and like they do emphasize diversity a different way up there 
and I think part of it is like the acknowledgement, starting out with the acknowledgement of the land that their campus is on and not like shying away from that. Um, yeah. It's a little different up there. Yeah, well, so that's even different now because back in the day they didn't do that. <laughs> but uh-huh. like, I think the land acknowledgement that's happened in the last, I don't know, six, seven years. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, when I was there, they, they didn't do that, even though they know they were built on hot mess land so yeah. burial grounds Bur- oh land. definitely burial ground on the mound yep yeah i never it's knew. really interesting like you learn about the history of different campuses and like some places are very outspoken about it and then other places are like it's land yep hmm I was wondering what you what your dissertation work was focused on. Yeah, so my dissertation was on it was called um, journalists behaving badly, and it was about how courts in the United States have decided cases where journalists had gotten information, but the information was gotten like unlawfully. Mm. And what did the First Amendment mean in these cases? So it was about like invasion of privacy, trespassing, uh, when journalists were being passed, like stuff that they weren't supposed to have, like unlawfully recorded stuff, uh, deceptive interviews where they like hid cameras, all that good stuff. And, or when they lied to people they were interviewing to get information. Mm. Like what, what were the courts, how were the courts deciding this? And then where, when did the constitution come in or was the constitution being interpreted as, oh, it doesn't, that doesn't count for this because you behaved in a certain way. And so it was a lot of privacy stuff, which has led to all the privacy surveillance, data governance stuff that I do now um, mm-hmm. related to media and technology. Are you kind of a spy? Am I? <laughs> Are you like an anti-spy? I, I think I'm anti-spy because I'm anti-data being collected about people when they don't give you your, their permission. But I also think you shouldn't be able to get permission, period. So Yeah. Yeah, huh. a lot of times people sign away stuff that they have no idea what in the world the implications are later. Yep. Exactly. Uh, wait, wait. A lot of times, like every day. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Sometimes people don't have a, a choice about it. And so I'm, I'm really concerned about those things. Yeah, like I was helping my mom get more space in her iCloud. And, you know, when you go through and you have to check the permissions, it's like, you know, if you want to be able to use your phone, you kind of have to agree. But, like, what are you agreeing to? yeah. And even like Apple tries to force you to use either uh, thumbprint or facial recognition. I'm like, I don't want to do mm-hmm. facial recognition. Just to open my phone, just I'll I'll yeah. type in the number. Like mm-hmm. it's not that big of a deal to me. So yeah, that trade, good what are notice will with remain face? on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we definitely trade convenience for our own privacy. Like even using Gmail, like. For the we for the service of using Gmail, we let them read every bit of our emails so they can better target us for ads and things. But also the mm. alternative is make your own email engine. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, that's not it. Hilarious. Well, I think this is really cool. So that's kind of how you kind of transitioned into where you are now. Yeah, uh, for the most part. Um, I think I was so immersed as a PhD student and like at the end of law school, but as a PhD student into like one, one area and like mass communication. But as I started, Mm -hmm. continue to do the research, I know that the people that I was citing and I was reading and I was excited about their work were in a lot of different fields. So Mm -hmm. obviously mass com or media, but then the I or information school people some cs people or like hci people of course the law people uh, still publish in law but of course the law people and so it it allowed me to see various perspectives 
uh, mm-hmm. and various topics that I found that were really interesting. They were connected in certain ways to what I had done already, but they were out there in areas that I hadn't really touched. And so I kind of tried to follow those areas to see how it connected to what I was doing, how I felt, what I'm interested in. Um, and then that's how I kind of like have focused a little bit more on like emerging media, emerging technology versus the traditional, I would say, journalism or media areas. When I connected with you, I think you were working in the STEM translational communications space. And so I learned of you as a policy AI person, which I thought was really fascinating at the time. There wasn't as much talk around AI. That was maybe like 2016-ish, I want to say. So it was interesting to find someone who was like doing something in that space. Um, And I know that you've continued staying in that area. Um, And there's a, a recent book that you've contributed to a couple (laughs) of books. And then Kyla just pointed out this article about like fact of celebrity gossip. Yeah. Tell us about that. I want to hear about that. (laughs) So (laughs) um, it was a part of uh, uh, the university of Missouri, their law school and their journalism school. They had, they hosted this symposium back up this spring Mm -hmm. in like uh, Uh March, April, uh, because it is the, I don't know, 50th, no, I'm sorry, um, like 60th year of this very, very important uh, law case, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan, and it's about defamation. Mm. And it was a huge U.S. Supreme Court case. It uh, involved the NAACP. It's a civil rights case, if we're we're being at all um, clear, but most people just look at it as a defamation case. And it basically says that if somebody, uh, a public official, so somebody working like the president, mayor, governor, but even other people who are in charge of like uh, really important public facing um, government, you know, stuff. So that could include uh, police officers or whatever. If they want to sue somebody for defamation related to their job, like how they conduct their job, they have a higher uh, level of proof or burden of fault mm. to, pro- to prove than like a regular person like you and I. They have to prove actual malice. They have to prove that the person who published the um, s- statement acted with knowledge that the statement was false or reckless disregard. Like they entertained doubt, mm. but they were just like, I don't care, whatever. Let me just mm. publish it. Right. And then that has spread not just to public officials, but to public figures. So mm. celebrities, sports stars, these influencers <laughs> even, and like people who um, you have a attained a certain level of fame they too so that means it's really hard and the reason for that is um we want to make it really hard because when you get a lot of little bit of fame you get some power guess what people are going to talk about you should you be able Mm -hmm. to sue all the people that talk about you no however if they do talk about you and they know it was wrong they know they were lying then you do have recourse to go after them so the paper is about social media, but is also about gossip culture Mm -hmm. and how gossip culture, culturally, um, especially online, there is a demand for receipts. Mm -hmm. And this demand for receipts parallels the demand for like fact checking in journalism. So you go online, whether it's Lipstick Alley, any of these like YouTube um, gossip. Opinion people. (laughs) opinion people (laughs) right many of them if you look in their comments people are like show us the receipts tell us how you know this how how do we verify Mm -hmm. that you're not just lying oh you know if you're gonna spill tea then you need to let us know that the tea is not actually pee water or whatever the case (laughs) may be right (laughs) show us the receipts is the refrain that's the same thing in journalism you need to how, how do you get this information um have you made this stuff up how do we trust you? Show us 
the documents sometimes. And so I just paralleled those because our latest uh, iteration of the U.S. Supreme Court has said things like, we may not need this standard anymore because that means mm -hmm. nobody could mm -hmm. ever win their case if you're a public figure and you're getting talked about. Well, maybe they shouldn't win their case because Correct. they are a public figure and they're being talked about and sometimes falsity creeps in there, but it's not completely true, right? Yeah. Uh, I use the Cardi B versus Tasha. I was going to say that's the first thing I thought of. <laughs> that's that's the case I used. That's Cardi like B versus Tasha K. I was like, Cardi B done came off her pedestal to address this internet vlogger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. And I know you're eating up this Diddy well. case right now. I know we try not to date our podcast, but yeah, that's also interesting. Go, allegedly, 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 allegedly. Right. <laughs> Hey, I mean, I think it's important to talk about those things, but yeah, like people have been talking trash about people forever. They have, and they'll continue to talk trash about people. But uh, the thing is, are they entertaining doubts about it? Uh, is one, and it's also it's one thing that that if you or I were at lunch and we said something about somebody a famous person in particular, it doesn't matter. But when you have a right. platform like Tasha mm -hmm. K has and the people who are telling her, no, you're wrong. That's wrong. And you, and you double down on it. Right, right, right. And you have an opportunity to apologize. And then you don't. And you don't. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is the convergence. This paper, I think, was a convergence of like social media and media dynamics and ecosystems, but also policy and privacy and, and those kinds of things. That is so fascinating. So, I'm about to change departments. <laughs> what? <laughs> now, you know, nothing you do relates to any of this. It so can. stay over where you are. I'm like Jasmine, I like to learn, you know, I, I want to just deep dive and be like, no, what else? Cause I have some, a few things, a few ideas. I'll discuss okay, offline. only if. <laughs> You get a PhD and another master's degree. I mean, then you can do it. I can always collaborate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's true too. Um, so you work at Harvard? But, uh, no, no, don't work at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to your bio, you know, we didn't, we skipped this piece of you, um, My apologies. being a, a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and that is at Harvard. So what is that? So uh, in 2018, 2019, I was a fellow uh, at BKC, the Berkman Klein Center um, for Internet and Society. And that means I was in Cambridge, Boston um, during that year, and I was working on, a, a, well, quite frankly, a couple of projects, but it's like one main project in connection to that center. Um, and then after my fellowship year ended, they kept me as an affiliate so that I still like am involved and welcomed at all their programming, welcome to provide content, welcome to, um, speak during certain, you know, programs related to things I do and like, mm -hmm. uh, participate in some of the like working groups and other things like that. That's really cool. I, um. I hope that I'll get a chance to do something like that in my career. Cause I think it's really awesome to have the chance to like be in a different context. Right. And I, we get complacent. I think when we stay too still, which is why I'm always on a plane somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, so. I think it's, it's, it's very good to make sure your network and your ecosystem mm -hmm challenges you um, mm. with different kinds of thinking and thoughts, but also challenges any blind spots that you may have in connection to the different topics that you're interested in. Um, and also just seeing what other people are doing, like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. How did you even mix these things together? Like, yeah. wow. So, yeah. And as though you mm -hmm. weren't busy enough, you also consult. Um, can you tell us, and I'm going to get the name, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Alvieri Consultant. Uh, tell us about that. What do you do when you're consulting? 
So um, usually consult for organizations thinking about strategy, thinking about um, design, and in connection to those things that I know about, which is uh, media technology and people. <laughs> so <laughs> they're thinking about like programming and they're thinking about designing different things. They're thinking about how their policies and structures may contribute to um, harmful possible impacts or beneficial impacts in connection to data and privacy, surveillance, and those kinds of things. I talk to them about it, talk to them about ways that they can go about making their uh, systems and structures better, how they can design or redesign their programs in connection um, with whatever they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And in relation to people and also how they can commu better communicate about their policies, their programmings to people, to stakeholders, even though I don't even like that word, um, mm -hmm. about what it is that they're doing or they plan to do and to engage people and other stakeholders in doing that. That's awesome. That is so cool. I'm thinking about like this AI business that's been going on in the news. Sure. And, I mean, it's, it's really like chaos on some levels where I feel like every day there's a new article, there's a new opinion piece, there's a, a convening at the white house to discuss artificial intelligence and the direction that we're headed. Can you talk a little bit about like some of the, recent policies that you've seen around AI? Because some of it is very concerning. I agree with you. I think with any innovation, there should be concern because inevitably there are people who are ignored in the process of mm. deployment and creation. And... I'm always interested in thinking about how the people who created, deployed, implement, run it, whatever, yeah. are thinking about those people and who could be possibly be harmed. Um, and I, what's the calculus there? Like two people are <laughs> harmed, but a hundred people are not. Uh, what's the threshold for like saying, oh, that's okay. That's good enough. That, that I, I'm interested in like how people and organizations make these kinds of decisions, especially with artificial intelligence, which is a just a blanket term that covers so many different things and has had so many negative outcomes in connection to health, in connection to emissions, in connection to labor, in connection to autonomous vehicles. So and banking, criminal justice system, we, we know yeah. about as well. And, but, but these systems are still being deployed um, yep. without adequate policies that restrain or require organizations to um, do due diligence <laughs> about the possible harms that could happen with them. So I'm always interested in thinking about like, what are, what are the policies? The universe, I mean, not the university, but the United States of America is behind the world in so many ways because we don't have a basic thing and that is a omnibus federal data protection or privacy law. We don't have that, but other places, regions, the European Union, for example, has had the GDPR for such a long time now and we just can't even, mm. you know, convince Congress to function properly. So... <laughs> You know, those I kinds was, of so things. I was going to say, oh, it's because there's a bunch of people who don't understand technology, but that that's true. Right. Yeah. Parliament. Of, yeah. So yeah. I don't know. And they're in D.C. D.C. And, and D.C. has a, a critical mass of universities <laughs> with, with computer true. scientists and engineers, but policy people. They don't hear us. They yeah. don't. Uh, and so that's unfortunate where we are right now, but I'm look, looking at policies, whether the policies are internal to the organization or external, thinking about the states have stepped in in certain ways. Mm -hmm. uh, what do the states... Which is, 
say you yeah. know it depends on the state right like yeah. <laughs> exactly I mean, i think part of the issue too is that like a lot of ai algorithms like neural networks like it's literally a black box where you tell the computer hey assign certain weights to certain features and it's like all right i'm gonna put these inputs in it should get these outputs computer decide what's important and then if you were to ask the person who made it all the time they're like mm, i just ran it through here exactly. and it decided what was important so like explainable mm. ai is definitely definitely a huge thing that uh, people are starting to get more into now, as well as like communication of what the AI is doing. Like it's dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. And, well, and then like having to just like wait for uh, a policy maker to do something. Yeah. We're dealing right now with, you know, we have projects that involve teachers using artificial intelligence in the classroom and they have to use, you know, have access to the internet. The kids have to be able to deploy certain tools, but the school districts are like, we don't understand it. We don't know. So no one can use anything. Like we're going to ban it. It's like, I, I kind of wish, you know, we could take a pause nationally perhaps and make some determinations before we just continue allowing people to move forward we know that's not going to happen right because money but for states or districts to be mandating like children not have access to even learn about it is odd to me it's a weird stance it's a very weird stance since they're going to be confronted with it whether they like it or not they are confronted with it right <laughs> and they're using it technically right if they're accessing Netflix existing tool. Yeah. Well, not even Netflix, like Microsoft products, Google products. That's true. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I completely agree. I would also say that there are unfortunately school districts and just wide swaths of people left behind mm -hmm. because we allow a, a digital divide that doesn't necessarily have to exist. So bad connectivity is is a huge thing. Like what is your broadband speed? Or do you even, are you able to get broadband in the place that you're living? Or are you subject to just terrible service from the only game in town, so to speak, related to a broadband provider? Like I think all of those issues, um, feed into where we are in connection to our relationship in the United States with artificial intelligence, with other emerging media technology. Yeah, it reminds me of like early stem cell conversations because like I have a friend who, you know, that was her PhD research and people would literally be like at the lab or contacting her advisor and saying they're killing babies to get stem cell <laughs> research done. And she's like, do you really think that would pass? You know, but I just think of the same thing. Like if you're not educated in something you don't understand, you're gonna just start to make all these rules and laws or just completely ban it because you don't know what it does, but educate yourself. But also we have people who need to sit down that are, you know, they're a little bit past their prime when it comes to to learning <laughs> so you know we definitely need some overhaul there mm. in agreement with that <laughs> but i wanted to ask yeah. you too i know you've been focusing lately on rural ai can you talk about like what that means specifically yeah so in this larger conversation about artificial intelligence we're having some people are having the conversation about bias and justice and equity. And usually though, when they're talking about that, they're thinking about things like gender and they're thinking about things like race and sometimes language and some, sometimes uh, ability or disability. However, <laughs> what I, I know for a fact is we're left out of this conversation. There are many people, right? But who are left out of this conversation is what is the impact of geography? on mm -hmm. the ability to interact with, connect with, or not connect with artificial intelligence. To me, in the United States in particular, but around the world, rural spaces are being left out of this conversation. We know that rural spaces are um, many times left without significant development that has impacts on things important like education, 
labor, climate and environment, of course. Um, health is a, a huge issue. And of course, that connectivity issue is really important as well. But they're left out of this conversation. And even if you, you think about the United States in particular with the Biden administration last year, so this October marked a year since they put out their blueprint for an AI like Bill of Rights. And yeah. even if you look at that, if you study that document, it seems really good, but it leaves out rural. And actually, if you do a search, you know, uh, command F and you look for rural, it's mentioned maybe twice. And that's just and rural, not really <laughs> digging into the, again, social determinants of rural that make it different from the concerns of an urban or a population center. And that's really an important thing to dig into when you're thinking, thinking about things like equity and justice. What does justice look like in a rural context that makes it different than for a population center? And that's really important when we think about policy for mm -hmm. these things. And so I, I'm digging into this, particularly because, look, we live in Alachua County and but for uh, the University of Florida and maybe like one or two other industries in Gainesville, all of Alachua County would be considered rural um, yep. because people wouldn't be living here <laughs> if we're if we're honest. And that would take away a lot of infrastructure. that's here. And even with Gainesville here, it's a it's a small city. Um, we don't have the best service. <laughs> we still when don't you have said that good broadband service. One service provider, I, it immediately triggered me. I was like, uh huh, yeah. Um, let's talk about these utilities and why I don't have access to more than one company and how they have a monopoly over the area. But that's reality for people. That is very much reality. I, I've actually had a student say, hey, I know we have to take the um, exam online, but is there a way that I could take it? Can you open it up for me using Canvas or whatever? Can you open it up for me at a different time? Because if I go home, I won't be able to have internet service because they lived further out. And, and, it, and that was a couple of years ago. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, wow, I hadn't even considered the fact that students, some students may not have, because of where they live, they may mm -hmm. not have access to, um, reliable broadband. It didn't occur to me, and that was a blind spot on my my part, but I think that occurs a lot with when mm -hmm. we're thinking about technology and new technology implementation. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to, we can get hype. We're going to do this, and, and this is going to be great, and students are going to put on these Oculus, and then <laughs> they, they can't even connect to, you know, they don't have good mobile phones over service. Right. They don't have good telephone service so like we have to dial that back um mm -hmm. certain times yeah it's all real that was all really real yeah yeah i never i mean i've thought about it but like even like you said we always design for the best case scenario everyone has access to technology strong wi-fi lots of money and this is how this solution works so we need to think about these other cases yeah that's that's real <laughs> Who do you mostly get funding from for your research? Oh, <laughs> um, I have um, been um, right now on an NSF mm -hmm. um, award. I've gotten an award from Google. Oh, before. congratulations. Um, thank you. I've... Um, I've gotten uh, funding from Knight, Knight Foundation. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix of, you know, whoever whoever decides my proposal is good enough for them, yeah, them to, yeah. to fund it. But I do look at, like, uh, private and uh, philan private philanthropies, corporate organizations, if they are hands off. Mm -hmm. Like they just give you the money and say, go do what you want to do. <laughs> That's the best money. Uh, and then of course the, the feds, the, the federal government, NSF, <laughs> NIH feds. kind of uh, applications. Yeah. I was asking because I've seen more and more calls from NSF for things that are transformative in rural populations. So I'm like, NSF would literally eat this up. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's true. There's a lot out there right now, especially in like computing focused on rural communities so. yeah very cool um 
how do people like get into the space you're in right because i feel like you chose journalism but you're not what i would think of when someone says journalist right so like are there multiple pathways to get to where you are like in terms of the work that you do i think so um you don't have to you don't you don't have to major in journalism, you don't have to major in like media or communications at all. You just have to be interested in some of the similar things, right? Mm-hmm. And and even with that, your approach can be from various foundational principles. You can come at it from like the anthropology side. You can come at it from the I know like people who are rhetoricians, like the rhetoric mm. people. You can come at it from like you all the engineering side and the many engineering sides to um, thinking about artificial intelligence and and policy. And of course, there's the law side, which is just like you just straight up go to law school and then you know find yourself as either a, a policy working in like uh, you know the FTC, the FCC, or um, at a, a, a law firm that thinks about or works in these issues, whether as a litigator or uh, otherwise a contract person, right? So I think there's various different ways. Is this really what you're interested in? What what are your interests? And not just what are your interests, but like <laughs> uh, what are your goals with mm. respect to the things that you're doing? Like, do you want to change some things or you just want to like um, see where things go? Uh, do you want to change things public facing or do you want to change things internal to an organization all of those are different questions that people have to answer for themselves but there are various different ways to get into this i guess broad area related to like Mm -hmm. policy media technology yeah if you had to do it all over like is there anything that you would change or do differently i mean (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think so. I think I would spend more time away from academia. And, and and I say that as a person who even now struggles to consider herself an academic, like I'm always looking like, how can I connect with these people who are not in academia. Um, Mm -hmm. And I say that because in this area, thinking about media, technology, policy, theory is great, but I wanna know how things actually work, how people Mm -hmm. actually behave. Uh, I wanna see it, I wanna see their workflow. Like how do the designers and the, the policy people and the marketing people and whoever else, how, how does all of that converge to us on the outside getting whatever it is that we're getting? So mm-hmm. uh, I would think I would spend some more time away from academia. And I say this again, as a person who has pursued away from academia <laughs> opportunities while in academia. <laughs> so there's that, but I think like maybe like postdoc, uh, like a long postdoc or a couple of postdocs in, in different places, probably um, uh, external to academia or whatever the case may be. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. I can see it. It's, it's coming. I feel like it's going to happen soon and going to be away. It'll be like your sabbatical. See, I was on sabbatical last year. It'll be sabbatical number two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it won't be sabbatical. It'll be like, leave. <laughs> right, it's called, I'm gone. <laughs> no, I'm gone. You can take like Don't small leave us leaves. You can, I forget what it's called, but you can take like academic leaves and go other places. This is what I heard. We'll see how that plays <laughs> out. 
<laughs> like when people do like NSF program officer assignments and stuff, like you can always you should do like a Fulbright points. or something like that. Oh yeah. Yo, that's on the list of things to okay. do. <laughs> Fulbright. Let me do Fulbright in the Caribbean. Oh um, man. I like it. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's where Airbnb. you started off. Like, hey, I want to do all this stuff Costa in all these Rica. different countries. I'm just saying. Who has the best beach? Go there. AI oh, on the beach is like that's the dream. Sounds amazing. I could see it. I literally just had a whole scene play in my head. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, Jasmine, thank you so much for being here with us, talking about your trajectory. Um, I want to ask if there's a way for people to find you on the internet how should they do that where should we find you yeah so i have a website it's jasmine um i guess you can find me there but mm -hmm. i'm also on the artist formerly known as twitter so x <laughs> uh, <laughs> under jasmine mcneely and i guess i'm on linkedin as jasmine mcneely and i guess blue sky is uh up and coming as a alternative to twitter i don't know i'm kind of, i'm there but like i don't know what i'm doing there, it's not home so yet I'm, I'm it's still no. kind of feeling it out yeah <laughs> she got a pinky toe in <laughs> exactly <laughs> yes and I would also say that people should check out um, your UF webpage for like a lot of your articles and things that you've been working on and just news about like what you've been doing. You have like a wide variety of fascinating stuff that you've been doing. <laughs> Try. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me.